So for tonight's agenda, so we're just going to kind of go over a little bit of the project overview for the comprehensive plan. Uh, we'll have the presentation by Kevin, and then we'll get into some of the next steps that um, we'll be going through throughout the project. So the project timeline, uh, we're very closely nearing the end of phase one. Uh, this is a five phase project. So we're in the assess phase. This is where we're in our like data collection, kind of getting some uh, preliminary ideas and things like that. Um, our next phase is kicking off in December and that's gonna go through March of next year. Uh, this is gonna be our explore phase where we're really working into some of the data that we've collected and really seeing um, kind of like the baseline um, elements and things that we discovered in the assess phase. And then we have our third phase that we'll be getting into, which is our organized phase, where we really start putting those ideas together. Um, our fourth phase is our prioritize phase. Um, that one is where we really, it's pretty self-explanatory, but we start prioritizing those ideas and the recommendations that we're coming up with. And then our last phase, which um, goes through December of 2025 through March 2026, um, is our adopt phase, and it's also self-explanatory, but that's where we'll be taking the uh, actual plan to adoption. Okay, well, um, went through that pretty quick, but I'll go ahead and hand it off to Kevin now so uh, we can go ahead and get started with going through some of this really awesome, important information. Thank you, Maddie. Mm -hmm. Well, good evening, guys. Um, I see some familiar faces from the first meeting. I see a few new ones um, as well. Um, so a comprehensive plan talks about the growth, future growth and development of your community. Um, and for those of you who have followed the process so far, maybe... Um, and going back to um, you know the, the kickoff conversations, some of, maybe even some of the, the website stuff that you've interacted with, um, our firm's approach to every comp plan that we do um, is about growing in a fiscally sustainable way, growing in a way that your city can afford to continue to provide services and infrastructure um, going forward, but also keeping it affordable for uh, residents um, as well. And so kind of a the central element or the focus piece of of all of our work is what we call a land use fiscal analysis it's where we look at the um, the tax productivity of the development pattern we look at how different um, development in the community is doing in terms of revenue per acre what it costs to serve things of that nature but before we show that which we'll do um, later in november we'll actually show the results of the analysis for garland um, we like to have a conversation just about some concepts that um, that I've learned over the years working locally and across the country um, and what it's going to mean for this process for you all and give you all the, the opportunity to ask some questions on these concepts before you see the, the real numbers for Garland. So a couple of questions to, to think about as we get started. So does your city here, does Garland have the money it needs to pay for services and infrastructure? Those of you that are here in person, ra raise your hand if you feel like the city has the money it needs. Okay, we got a few. Um, no, I'm talking about cash. Let's we'll talk about that. We've got a question. How would we know that? That's a very that's a very important question. Um, number two, can everyone who wants to live in your community afford a home? Right. Uh, number three, can locals in your community build wealth or do the policies, development policies and incentives favor larger outside developers and businesses? And number four, uh, do you have a common language in your community with shared values and decision-making principles that, that are used consistently when you talk about, when you have conversations about growth and development, um, and especially when your decisions are being made about what projects are being improved, what infrastructure you're investing in? Um, if you don't have that consistent common language, you need to. Um, and so I'm gonna talk about um, some of this. So going back, I mentioned this quickly in the, the first presentation, but um, my background is in civil engineering. Uh, we're taught in engineering school to design bigger, better uh, growth. Um, a lot of, uh, <laughs> at the time I went through school and the work that I did um, in the engineering portion of my career is very much auto-centric growth, suburban style growth. Um, here in North Texas, it was very rapid uh, growth as well. Uh, but in 2008, 2009, uh, I switched, I got in a bit of a hybrid role and then transitioned full time into national director of my former firm's community planning practice. And so I went from the engineering world to the planning world, working with cities all over the country. Uh, and something that started to emerge to me as I was working on comp plans like this, downtown plans, sustainability plans, all kinds of plans, um, but was no matter where I went, if it was a big city or a small city, rural, urban, suburban, no matter where I went, very few cities had the money that they needed to pay for their infrastructure. Streets, water, sewer, drainage, parks. Um, and when you dig a little bit more, 
what the mayors and the city managers would say, we're trying to keep up with all of these growing wants and needs of our community with limited resources. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit more about these resource and affordability gaps as we go through here. But, um, but that process of working around the country, seeing this infrastructure and, and housing affordability gap emerging in different places, and then coming back to North Texas and thinking, why or what are we doing differently that's going to keep us from ending up like a Shreveport, a Memphis, um, a Detroit, if you want to go that big, a um, Ferguson, Flint, Jackson, all of these places that you see on the, ne the news that are having failures, whether it's bankruptcies, soft defaults, um, infrastructure failings, it all comes back to the development pattern. It all comes back to the rate and pattern that they grew um, and their service and, and tax structure. So ultimately, 2011, that led me to leave, start Verdunity. Um, we focused really the first, I don't know, gosh, eight years or so completely in Texas. And now this whole fiscal sustainability thing is starting to um, get out to other places um, as well. So we're venturing out to other parts of the country as well, even though I promised my wife when I started Verdunity that I was trying to get out of that whole travel thing. So here we are again. Um, when you look at a city's website, when you look at their strategic plan or maybe a previous comprehensive plan, you'll see some version of, of these things. We want to be fiscally solvent or fiscally responsible or fiscally sustainable. We want to be environmentally resilient. We want to be socially inclusive. We want to be, uh, we want to preserve a high quality of life. We want to provide affordable housing for everyone. You'll see versions of this, right? But when you look at the daily decisions that are made, when you look at those projects that are approved, the infrastructure that we build, the housing developments that we build, they don't always align with those outcomes. And so we have fragile local economies and city budgets. We've got deteriorating infrastructure. We've got growing affordability gaps. We've got some unsafe neighborhoods. We've got frustrated residents that can really take the form of everything from apathy to heck, you know, I'm just not even going to spend time anymore to flat out anger, right? The whole, the whole spectrum. When, you, when I say frustrated residents, there's a whole spectrum in there based on what the issue is and when, where you are. Um, but when you talk to folks inside City Hall, you especially planners um, that, that are doing this kind of work, um, you'll hear that we're administering outdoting, outdated zoning codes or outdo, outdated z development standards and, and policies, that, policies that are creating these generic places um, that are unsafe in some ways. Um, and really when it gets down to it, residents and businesses struggle to connect with these places. And if you struggle to really deeply connect with somewhere, you're not going to reinvest in it, right? As soon as your house starts to get older, or as soon as your a Walmart and the big box starts to outlive its life, you're going to pick up and go to the next new place. Now in Texas, what that means for us is what? Out to the next ring and out to the next ring and out to the next ring. Well, if you talk to folks over at our regional MPO, our, our uh, planning organization for North Texas, um, they will tell you that if you look at North Texas as, a, as an area, it's starting to look awfully similar to Detroit. Detroit became a donut, right? The very, very core had a lot of resources in it, and the very edges, and the edges had, had a lot of resource and investment in it. And the middle ring hollowed out, right? People either moved back into the core or they moved out into the, the newest uh, suburbs on the edge. North Texas is starting to look like that as well. And so when you think about water, when you think about transportation infrastructure and what it takes to sustain our system, whether you're at a city level, a county level, TxDOT, um, the water districts that provide water, they're all, they all have a funding gap. They all have massive needs that they have to take care of and nowhere near enough money to take care of it. Um, so I already kind of talked about this, but as I was working around the country and still today, I asked city managers and mayors, what's the biggest challenge when it comes to managing growth and development in your community? The majority will say some version of this. How do we keep up with the growing wants and needs uh, of our community with the limited resources that we have. And it's really interesting when you, when you think about this in the context of shifting from a growth community where you're rapid growth and you have a lot of new revenue coming in to a redevelopment or an infill kind of community where Garland is and most of your city is built out and has to be maintained and ultimately replaced. Um, it's a very different conversation. And in Texas, we're just now starting to get there versus a lot of these places I worked with around the country that really made the, the light bulb go off. 
uh, for me. So this is the question that I was asking back in 2010, 2011. With all the wealth and growth that we've experienced in, in this country, why are our cities struggling to pay for basic infrastructure? <laughs> Bad management. Um, and so this was, this was, I mentioned, you know, this was what I was doing before I had my aha moment. I was designing neighborhood streets for cities all over North Texas, worked on a few high profile highway projects like the, the one you see on the right. That was um, probably the coolest project that I ever touched um, as an engineer. I got in a lot of trouble as a young engineer working out in Vegas. You can only imagine a single engineer in Vegas. Uh, <laughs> um, but, you know, again, in engineering school, we're taught how to design these things. We're not taught how are we going to pay to maintain after it's built, right? I give a lot of talks at schools now to engineering groups and to planning groups, for that matter, about this stuff because it's just not something that we've thought about uh, in this country until here more recently. So this happened. You all remember that. Right. Um, and so this was I remember at my old job, I, I, I mean, it was just a matter of weeks. We had fax machines back then. And like it, this, this started to happen and we started to get fax after fax after fax with city projects being shut down, tech stop projects being shut down, county projects being shut down. And like our whole architecture engineering world came to a complete stop in the matter, matter of like three weeks. And I remember then thinking like this is like this is crazy fragile. Right. And then shortly after that, we pump some stimulus money in and all things go back to normal. Right. Um, this is another thing I saw working around the country. Fragile, the fragile economies and local bankruptcies. Everybody's heard of Detroit. We all know about Detroit. Um, I like to talk about San Bernardino here. Uh, my dad worked for Shell growing up. We lived all over the place. One of the places we lived was San Bernardino. Um, we lived there in the late 70s, 78. 77 to 79, I think it was. Um, but at the time that we lived there, it was best place to live, work, play, rapidly growing community, um, brand new neighborhoods, brand new schools, brand new uh, businesses, everything that we talk about, you know, in our North Texas suburbs today, right? Um, well, in 2011, they filed for bankruptcy. <clears throat> Stockton, same story. Suburban area filed for bankruptcy. Um, there are this, I think this is from 2019. I could add way more to this now. And there's a whole next group of cities and counties that are teetering right underneath that line. And what you're seeing with those is it's kind of like, y'all remember the story about Flint, Michigan with the water and Jackson, Mississippi, right? Those are basically soft defaults. When a city doesn't have the money it needs to maintain basic infrastructure like water, right? And things fail, <clears throat> that's a soft default. It's not a hard bankruptcy, but it's still, they're not able to provide um, and continue basic services. There's a lot of cities around this country that are right on that line. All they need is one weather event, you know, one bad pipe, and down it goes. I'm not going to be all doom and gloom tonight, I promise. Um, we also have increasing affordability gaps. Um, we're all aware of it. We're talking about it here in Texas. Um, we saw it on both coasts first, but now we're seeing it here. If you, if you don't build enough supply, if you don't build enough housing units, um, the value of the housing that you have is going to continue to get pushed up. It's a supply and demand conversation. Um, and something that we're struggling with in Texas is how do you provide the supply for so many people in this region um, in the land that we have with the infrastructure that we have with the budgets that we have to, um, to work with. So we're going to talk a lot about um, housing options as we go through this process as, um, as well. So this, this is kind of what I saw, right? I, I, I saw aging parts of the country. I come back to, to Texas where we've got this fast growth. And, and really, when you study communities across the whole country, really, what you see is post-World War II, after the invention of the car and with some of the housing policies that were happening at that time, cities all over this country and especially in texas started to aggressively pursue this fast growth model the higher quality of life building a whole bunch of subdivisions all at once um, in the short term without fully considering the long-term costs um, and impacts and so i uh and so i started to ask this well i saw this and then i started to come back here and started to challenge 
cities to ask this question. Well, what about maintenance after growth? Things are easy when you're growing. You've got additional tax revenue coming in. You've got people coming in. You've got businesses wanting to come to your community. But when that growth flattens out and all of a sudden those, those places need reinvestment, right? Does your city have what it needs to maintain everywhere? Do they have to pick certain neighborhoods? Um, and this is, uh, this is what happens. You see great neighborhoods that they don't get that reinvestment and the people who have the wealth and the means to do so will move out and the ones who don't have the means to do it get stuck, right? And on the right, you see some commercial options, um, you know, whether it's strip centers, whether it's big uh, malls, we're starting to see these all over the country that they're abandoned um, in favor of new greenfield commercial developments, um, mostly out on the edge as well. So I would argue that we're building cities that we can't afford to live in as residents and we can't afford to maintain them as cities. Not everywhere, but the vast majority of communities in this, um, in this country are somewhere in this situation. Some I think are salvageable, some are toast. Um, luckily for us, most of, most of our cities in Texas are still uh, salvageable because we are blessed to have so many resources and, um, and growth still happening. So um, this is a group, Strongtowns, uh, strongtowns.org is their website. They're a nonprofit group that talks a lot about um, these same development concepts. Um, I would strongly encourage anybody that's listening or watching here tonight or uh, watches this later, um, go check them out. They have a ton of content that they push out with videos, podcasts, books, all, the, all kinds of stuff. Um, Chuck is someone I met back in 2010 when I was struggling with these things. He and I are good friends and do a lot of collaboration together today. But this quote from him really sums up what our challenge is, and it talks about the way that our cities account for infrastructure. We show infrastructure on our books at the city level as um, a depreciating asset. So when we build a road, it's viewed as an asset to our community, right? And so it, over the life of it, that value just appreciates. At the end of that life, we don't have anything on our books to account for what the cost is to rebuild that street or water line or drainage pipe or whatever. They should be accounted for as deferred liabilities. We should have a number on our books out in the future that says when this road gets to the end of its life cycle, we have that 2 million, 10 million, whatever it is to rebuild that road. So he asked, how come they don't do that? That has to get into uh, fiscal policies with cities. There's a lot of conversations about changing this right now. Yes, sir. That is an excellent question. That is an excellent question. He asks if is it does it a deferred liability imply that there's a fund that that money is going into and being saved up to account for that cost in the future? And the answer is no. Um, so this is what Chuck's getting at here is basically we have this iceberg, right? We have all of this infrastructure and I'm going to unpack this more in a little bit. We have all of this infrastructure that gets built in the growth mode and it's just like ticking away, ticking away, ticking away and then boom, we've got we've to maintain it. And do our cities have the money? Um, and in most cases they don't because in our growth mode, and I'm getting way ahead of myself in this presentation, um, but in growth mode, what do our councils want to do when we're growing and we have surplus revenue? Or lower the tax rate, right? They get a lot of pressure to lower the tax rate. That's an easy way to get elected or reelected, especially, especially today. Um, so one of the things I learned talking with Chuck and working around the country is this connection between our development pattern, the way, the rate, and the pattern that we build our cities um, and the long-term fiscal health um, of them. So this is the historic development pattern, right? This is pre-World War II. This is the way we built our cities before we had a car, right? Most of the cities all over this country, even here in Garland, the square, right? We had a place, a few people came together and said, we want to live and work here. They would build a few buildings and they started to do their thing. Over time, more people would, would want to come and, and the city would grow incrementally out, incrementally up, and a little incrementally more intense, right? As they had the resources and the people to do so. There was no debt, there was no financing, there were no special design guidelines or anything like that. We just built it incrementally as we had the need 
and the resources to do it, right? So over time, this is Chuck's hometown of Brainerd, Minnesota, an old kind of lumber, uh, lumber town. That, that little small street turns into this, right? If I showed you a picture of this street today, it's depressing as heck. You know what it is? It's a six lane road with parking lots on both sides and a bunch of vacant buildings. <laughs> um, this, this was a vibrant town. This was a very active community. You can see all the different people and types of transportation they had in the street. You can see all kinds of different building structures here. Lots of residential, commercial, all mixed together, all close together so that people could what, walk between them, right? This is probably my favorite street I've ever been to. This is in Indianapolis, Indiana. But you can see signs of traditional or, his, or historic development here. Um, on the right, you see front porches, right? We used, to, we used to design our neighborhoods with front porches to have, quote, eyes on the street, right? Everybody was out on the front porches. Everybody knew each other because we all saw each other walking by. You know, I remember growing up a, um, in a neighborhood in Illinois. We would walk home from school. And we had an old lady that was all, she was always out on her front porch offering us lemonade. We would go hang out with her for like an hour, almost every day after school and get all kinds of stories from her. It was, I learned some of the most amazing stuff from that woman. Um, and like, I try to tell my kids that story today and they don't have that. We have designed that out of our neighborhoods, right? The boogeyman lives next door. Why does the boogeyman live next door? Because we don't even know who, who lives next door half the time. So we're gonna assume the worst, right? Um, on the left side, what do you notice about this street? It's pretty narrow, isn't it? Right? That forces cars to drive slow. If you want cars to drive slow in a neighborhood, narrow the street and put all kinds of stuff right up close to it. You will force cars to drive slow. Now the engineers and the old engineer and me would tell you don't do that. Spread everything out and push it all out because that makes it safer for the drivers, right? So there's a lot of things here. The other thing I'll point out is the street trees on the left. If you, one of the easy ways to see an old neighborhood from a new neighborhood is where are those street trees at? Are they up closer to the sidewalk in the street where they're shading the street in the public realm? Or are they pushed way up in the yard where they shade the yard and actually get into your foundation? Right? I mean, I live in one of those subdivisions right now and it's driving me batty because it keeps, I have these huge trees in my yard, but they're, it's hard to keep the grass there and they're getting into my foundation and busting up our, you know, our steps up to the house. But, um, so this is the traditional pattern, right? Very compact, mix of uses, mostly walkable. Very um, heavy attention to detail with the architecture, with the aesthetics of places. They're all designed intentionally to make them visually appealing um, as you're walking around. So this is post-World War II suburban development, right? This is where we could go buy up 100 acres and we could knock out a whole bunch of homes all at once um, in a matter of a year. Um, and when you build a whole bunch of residential like this, where everyone has to drive around, what does that do to the stuff on the right, right? If everybody's driving around everywhere, it requires more and more roads, more and more intersections, more and more highways, and it leads to more of the big box commercial market, right? Where you have big box stores that draw from people all around versus those local stores that just draw from a smaller area. Does that make sense to y'all? Um, okay, so let's think about this in the context of, of the rate and the pattern of, of growth and what that means for, for our cities. If you look at this chart, you start on the left, you're a small town. Garland was a small town. You had, main, you had the, the square, maybe a few neighborhoods around it. You had a little bit of infrastructure. And you kind of went a while, right, before you really kind of hit growth mode. So that infrastructure around your square gets a little bit older. And then you kind of get in the middle of this, this uh, curve. What, what did, when did Garland go through their, their big growth spurt? I don't know off the top of my head, but 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s? OK. So market comes to you, you're in your growth mode, developers come in, they start to crank out the subdivisions, right? And so all of the roads and the water and the sewer and the, and the parks and the commercial, everything starts to come in in a matter of, usually when you study a lot of cities, it's a matter of two decades, 15 to 20, maybe 25 years. Lots of growth in a short amount of time. This tends to be what I call the best place to live, work, play phase of a city. You drive around town and you see mostly new neighborhoods 
and new stuff. And maybe that old historic part of town or that, that old part of town, the original part of town, it's historic, right? It's touristy now because it's kind of got that old feel to it and people want to go there and kind of visit. And if you have to maintain some of that oldest infrastructure, you have the revenue from so much new growth that you can go take care of those few you know, streets that were built back in the 20s or 30s, right? But as you continue to the right of this curve, you start to run out of land to develop. Garland is there, right? You don't have a lot of greenfield vacant land left to build on. So the, the revenue from new development slows down. The additional property tax revenue, the additional sales tax revenue, um, building permit revenue, impact fee, all, all of that revenue that comes from new growth starts to slow down, right? Um, how long does a street last? Anybody know? 30 to 50 years, yeah. Depending on how, if it's asphalt, concrete, how well it was built, anywhere from 20 to, to 50 older streets, you're really lucky if they get to 50 years. But so um, when was the growth? The 50s and 60s, right? In Garland, maybe into the 70s. So if you drive around a lot of those neighborhoods that were built, what do they look like today? A little tired, right? Um, and so imagine all over your city, if you build so much of your growth in that 20 year period, and then all of that infrastructure, especially streets, has to be rebuilt. It tends to happen kind of at the same time. Your revenues start to flatten out, and a lot of those maintenance and reconstruction needs start to hit your city, right? This is, this is Detroit, this is Flint, um, Ferguson, Missouri, Shreveport, Memphis. So most cities aren't thinking about that far right. They're not thinking about what do we do when we're past preventative maintenance or just fixing potholes or replacing a panel here or there. I'm talking this road is toast, the whole thing's got to be rebuilt or mostly rebuilt. What are we doing for that? Not just on one or two streets um, or even, you know, let's say 5% of our city streets as part of a bond program, but I'm talking about the whole thing, right? Um, so let's look at the, the footprint here. So the rate of growth is one thing. If you, if you build most of your city in a short amount of time, you can expect a lot of that infrastructure to have to be fixed in the same amount of time. It's just gonna come 30 to 50 years later, right? Um, the second thing is the growth or, or the land footprint. This is from uh, Victoria, Texas. I like to use this one just because it's very clear to illustrate the issue. We're building this for Garland as well. Um, and we'll talk about it in that next presentation that we do. Uh, but if you look at the green part, kind of right down in the, the bottom there, that's the original part of Victoria, Texas. If you look real closely, you can kind of see the gridded network of streets kind of coming through that green, right? So this was your traditional grid, narrow streets, mix of small and big lots, mix of different uses, that walkable, compact, traditional pattern. Then if you look at the yellow, orange, and red that goes out from that, that's 1950 and on. So think about when, when you expand your city out in that kind of footprint, what comes with it? All of the roads, all of the water, the sewer, the police, the fire, the parks, all of that stuff has to be served and maintained, right? So when you grow outward, you're taking off on a lot more service area, which is a lot more cost to serve and maintain. At the same time, we've been doing this in a lower density development pattern. So larger lots, more suburban spread out pattern, right? And so when you add more costs and you lower the dwelling units per acre or the households per acre, what happens? The cost per household goes up, right? But the catch is our cities aren't accounting for the full cost of that extra infrastructure. All we're doing is accounting for, look at the new growth, look at the revenue side, look at the additional property tax, look at the sales tax, right? We're not thinking about what's it, what it's gonna take to maintain those streets and water and sewer um, on, the, on the back end. So in Victoria's case, 1950 to 2015, their service area grew by 13 times, the population grew by four times. Um, so this is another metric that we look at. How big is your city limit area, your service area growing? Um, and how does that compare to the density of your city? Um, and density gets a lot of uh, bad reviews uh, from people sometimes. But one thing I can tell you with confidence is density pays the bills. 
Density generates much more revenue per acre um, than spread out development. Um, and if you do it well, the revenues can cover the additional costs that come with some of the more, more compact development as, as well, which I'll, I'm going to get into more as I go through this. So this is another thing that we started to do just to kind of help, um, help communities and, and residents and staff kind of understand this, this dynamic here. Um, we'll just pick certain streets. This isn't the best example. I like to use cul-de-sac streets because it's very easy to say all of the properties on this cul-de-sac street are the only ones benefiting from this street, right? Um, but essentially what we do is look at a street, look at the cost um, to replace that street. In this case, this street was going to cost a little over a million bucks to replace. Um, it's asphalt, so they were expecting to get 25 to 30 years out of it, right? If you look at the property tax revenue that's generated from those properties served by that street, um, in this case, they were getting an annual property tax revenue of just under $18,000 from those properties being served by that street. If 100% of the property tax revenue from these properties went to nothing but that street, it would take 58 years to pay it off. How long does that street last? Right? Um, how much of Garland's property tax revenue goes to streets? Anybody know? I, I can tell you it's not 100%, right? It's usually most cities are 4, 5, maybe 10% goes towards streets, um, just out of the general fund, and then there's some additional bond money on top of that that, that goes towards some. But, but we do a lot of examples of this, and, and sometimes there's some streets that will break, they'll kind of break even, they'll pay for themselves, right? But by and large, most, most of the time, we think when we build roads that it is going to generate the revenue to pay for that street. And in most cases, it doesn't. And so it has to be subsidized from other things, sales tax or other sources, or we just don't fix all of our streets. So what are our options to close these resource gaps? There's really three. The first is increased taxes and fees. That's not the most popular option, right? It does happen, it does tend to happen a lot when you get in a little more desperate, older kind of cities and they don't have a choice. You'll see street assessments. I, I can tell you one example from South Dakota. Um, they were behind, they went out and did a street assessment which basically says here's what this, this street is gonna cost to replace. The city paid for half of it. The other half got divvied up across all of the properties on that street. Every property owner got a bill in their mailbox and they had one year to pay it. So another extreme example, Omaha, Nebraska, which is actually growing and doing quite well, they actually had some of their streets that they intentionally let go back to gravel to not maintain them. So uh, Memphis, Tennessee is shrinking the size of their city. Their whole last comp plan was about reducing the size of their city to fit, so that, to fit the revenues they had so they could provide better service um, to a smaller area. Um, the second option is reduced services. This is basically what we're doing today. When we do a capital improvement program or a bond election um, or an annual city budget, we have a certain amount of revenue, right? And we match our services or we match our expenses to fit that revenue. For a capital improvement program, the engineering department may come to you and say, we have $500 million worth of needs and, you know, 25% of that is the worst, the stuff that we absolutely have to take care of. And then, well, we can only do a bond election to cover 10% of that. And then anything we don't fund gets deferred to the next year and the next year. And unfortunately, when we defer those things, what you see is those, the next time you do one, the costs are more. Either you have the same amount and the costs have just gotten higher due to inflation, or you actually have a lot more that's starting to fail as well. Um, so, neither one of those are really good options if you want to build a vibrant sustainable place the third option is developing more productively how can you develop in a way that aligns the the revenue productivity of your development um, with what and the services that are required uh, with what your residents are willing and able to pay for not just today but in the future um, in general what developing more productively means is this We've got to get a balance. You don't have to go all the way from one to the other, but we have to get a better balance between designing auto-centric places for cars and designing places that are scaled for humans, right? We're not, not everywhere, 
not every city is going to be 100% walkable and complete and mixed use and, and all of that. Um, but the only, to w the only way to make things pencil on the left side of that, if you're a very suburban, spread out place that's completely auto-centric, is home values have to be really, really high and your infrastructure has to be pretty minimal. So asphalt streets and bar ditches, septic, you know, right? Um, so we need, we've, we've swung way too far to the left of this. We got to get back um, in the middle. And doing this requires trade-offs. This is probably one of the most valuable slides that we have and something that we will continue to talk through all the way through this process. Um, there are trade-offs when you think about development. Um, how many of you want stable services, right? You, you want to have predictable, reliable police and fire, right? You want to have your water work when you turn it on. You want to have your toilet flush. Everybody wants those things, right? Um, how many of you want low taxes? We all want that too, right? Uh, okay, here's the catch. <laughs> how many of you want low density? Most of you probably do, right? It doesn't exist, man. It just, especially when you think about long-term costs, it, it's really, unless, unless, you're out in a rural neighborhood and your definition of stable services is you're okay if it takes 30 minutes for the fire department to get there. Then it might work, right? So you don't, you can play with these. You can have low, you know, you can have lower density, <clears throat> higher values, and maybe because of the higher values, they pay more in taxes. Um, and that's what makes it work. Um, you know, if you want stable services and low, and low taxes, higher density, is the path to get there. Um, but higher density doesn't always equate to stable services because there's a quality of life thing in there that a lot of people get. So we use this a lot of different ways to talk about different types of neighborhoods and what it means to quality of life and especially what it means to different generations and what they're looking for. Um, so how do we talk about these things? How do we talk about land use and growth management and street design and housing in a way that most people can connect with? Um, Fiscal sustainability is a common language. You know, I mentioned on that very first slide, what are some of the questions that you're asking and does your community have a common language that's used to frame discussions and inform decisions? Um, a question you will hear myself, you'll hear Maddie, every member of our team ask through this process, okay, Mr. Smith, I hear that you wanna do that. How are we gonna pay for that? How's the city gonna pay for that? And how are you gonna pay for that, right? Okay, city, you wanna do this. How are you, the city, going to pay for that? It has a, it has a way of kind of cutting right to the heart of the issue. And, and I'll compare, the analogy I'll give is buying a car. If I came to any of you guys and said, what kind, you're going to buy a car tomorrow, what kind of car, what kind of car are you going to buy? Right? That's all, that's the only criteria. You might say, I, I want to go get a Lamborghini. I want to go get a minivan. I, I, I don't know. But if I said, you're married, you have three kids, you live 45 minutes from work, um, and you make $70,000 a year, now what kind of car are you gonna go buy? Very different conversation, right? That's what this planning process is gonna be about. If when we ask about how is Garland gonna grow, how are you gonna pay for it? How's the, how's the city gonna pay for it? How are you, the residents, gonna pay for it? And a lot of this process gets, honestly, at we have to, as a culture, we really have to adjust our expectations for what we can get for our money, especially when it comes to housing and transportation. We have, as a country, have been living far, far, far beyond our means, um, and now it's kind of, um, it's kind of come and do. Um, okay, so how do we do this in a comp plan, right? How do we do this in a comprehensive plan or as part of a um, looking at how a city develops? I, Land use fiscal analysis is the way that we do that. We do these as standalone analyses. We do them a lot as part of comprehensive plans. We can do them sometimes as part of a budget exercise, um, especially with zoning conversations about bigger lots versus smaller lots and mixed use development versus big box commercial, things like that. Um, the first thing I, I want you to understand, and again, in the next presentation, we're gonna show Garland's results. So we're gonna show you Garland's actual numbers and math and, and performance and talk about that. But tonight I'm just gonna talk about some of the, the concepts so you can start to think about this. Um, 
And this is really, really important both for the staff in the back and also for residents is when we start asking you about like what kind of development can go here and what kind of development do you want to support and what kind of mobility options do you want to consider, what kind of housing do you want to consider, um, I want you to be thinking about it through, um, uh, through these uh, kind of metrics. So the first one is thinking about you know, the, the value of property, right? When we talk about how valuable a property is, we tend to think about what's the assessed value. This, this property is on the tax rolls for a million bucks, right? Or two million or whatever. That, that does account for the size of the property um, a little bit. Uh, but what we do is put it in terms of per acre. So you take the value of a property, you divide it by the size of the property, and you get a value per acre metric, right? These two maps that you see on the right are both for Dallas County, and you can see a very different picture. The, the darker the green, the more valuable the property is. The top one is assessed value, and you can see that there's high value properties scattered all over Dallas County, right? But when we put it in terms of value per acre, look where the value, look where the investment in Dallas County is happening, between 75 and 35, right? Anybody that's lived in Dallas for a while knows about the lack or has heard about the lack of investment in Southern Dallas. I have not found a map or a graphic that shows the problem any more clearly than this one does, right? So the first thing is value per, value per acre. It lets us look at development in an apples to apples kind of way. The next thing we do is we map this different ways. So we can do it in two dimensional, you know, top down maps like this. Um, we can also do it in 3D. Anybody know where downtown Dallas is? Right? In these, in these maps, the higher, the higher the bars, the more valuable, the higher value per acre. So, and I'm going to get into why this is, but what's interesting looking at it at a county level like this um, is you start to see how much power the metro centers of our regions really generate in terms of generating wealth for our region, right? The other thing that you see is, is you start to look at first and second and third ring suburbs through here. Um, and there's some, I, I, I pick on Cedar Hill sometimes because I know those folks down there, I like them, but I don't know if you, can y'all? Yeah, okay, right there. See that little bit of green right there? So Cedar Hill is a pretty affluent, fast growing third ring suburb. Um, and, you know, but look at, the, look at the size of those bars compared to downtown Dallas, right? Even compared to Las Colinas and, and the Irving area. Um, Garland has some places that do pretty well on this. Um, so the 3D maps, these are gonna become pretty important to look at. We'll do these in a dynamic way where you can zoom in and out and spin them around, all kinds of, all kinds of good stuff. Um, the next thing that we do, so we just look at the revenue per acre. So we look at what's the property tax revenue per acre for every property in the city. Then we take the budget and we say what portion of the general fund budget is paid for from property taxes and we allocate that back to the properties, right? So every property has a revenue number and then they have a cost associated with it from the general fund. And this leads to a net per acre. Um, if you're green in this scenario, you're generating more revenue than you cost to serve. If you're red, you cost more to serve than you're generating revenue, right? For current budget conditions. If you were to roll this all up citywide, you're still going to have revenues and expenditures are going to be even. But you can start to look property by property here how things change, right? In this case, this is from Brownsville, Texas. Um, before I show you the next one, I will tell you for, for them, and again, I, I like to include in this general presentation, I like to include slides that help me explain the concepts, which tends to mean they're pretty dramatic, right? When we worked with Brownsville back in 2017, just to rebuild all of the streets in that city, they needed $1.2 billion, $65 million a year on average. They were spending three, right? Big gap. Um, so the next level, so we show how, how are your properties doing with current budget conditions. This is what you have today. The next thing we do is say, if your street had the money, if, what would it take to rebuild all of the streets in Garland, right, on average, and we add that in. That's what Brownsville looked like when we added in the unfunded deferred street liabilities. So it went from this to that, right? This is what they really need. This is how their development is really performing. 
And so what you can do here is you start to zoom in and say, okay, the properties and developments that stayed green, even when we loaded more costs on, why? Right? Why, why did some areas stay green while others weren't red? Um, so let's look value development patterns. We're going to get into some things like this too, but if we just look at the value side, a couple of different examples here, rural with some infrastructure, suburban single family, um, and then townhomes on the right. Look at the, the value per acre difference between those three. Okay, this has nothing to do with cost. All this is is just taxable value per acre. So without changing the tax rate at all, you don't change the tax rate at all, the townhomes are gonna generate much more property tax revenue to the city than either of the other two, right? Yes, there are costs that go to this. And yes, a lot of people will say the more dense development you need, it adds, it adds more costs. Not always, sometimes. Um, and even if it does, the, the additional revenue that you get from this more compact development will cover those additional costs versus the two on the left, the one on the far left, if it's a state lots and has very, very high value homes on it, like I said earlier, it could potentially pencil out. The stuff in the middle is really hard to make pencil until you start to get to average home values of six, seven, eight hundred thousand. So a lot of folks that are living in suburban single family that got in for a two hundred thousand or maybe a three hundred thousand dollar home and they're complaining that their values are going up. All that's happening is the market is getting to what those homes really are worth with land values and what they really take to serve. So one of the questions that we're exploring with all the work that we do is how are people going to start to move around when the way that they've been living may not be what they can afford going forward. Um, second is on the commercial side, same thing. Suburban pad side on the left, big box in the middle, and a traditional downtown grid in the middle or on the right. The, the middle and the right ones are basically the same area. Um, the difference here is the big box, the majority of that area is taken up with a parking lot. The one on the right is made up mostly of buildings, right? And you may ask, well, what about parking? Everybody's parking, the big box has that you know, for people to park. Well, in the traditional grid, it's a combination of on-street parking that's kind of dispersed across the whole area, and maybe you do have a garage in there somewhere, um, somewhere where as well. But the traditional on the right is that more compact that they can get a lot of walkable traffic. They can get a lot of business happening from people that live and work right around there, right? Versus the big box, because of that auto-centric pattern, it, it has to draw people uh, from a wide area, which is why they have the bigger parking lot. Um, so density, if you think about affordability for, for households, what's your per, you know, your per household cost? Here's, uh, again, kind of a, a bit of an extreme example, but two blocks, the infrastructure is the same, right? The road out in front is the same. Think about just your typical residential block. The street, the water sewer, everything out in front is the same, right? If you just have a couple of houses on that block, all of those costs, those street costs, have to be shared between those two houses in the bottom one, right? The top one, if you put a mix of homes, you, maybe you put some accessory dwelling units in there, you put a duplex, you put a quadplex, you put a couple of single families in there, nothing crazy, just going back to that traditional mixed use kind of development pattern, right? Then you can spread those costs out, of, out across more households. So that cost per household comes down. So the density of development has a direct relationship to what the household liability is. We don't talk about that enough. Right? We just say, in this scenario, everybody here pays the same amount. Right? And so the ones that tend to be in the smaller homes and the more compact neighborhoods, in a weird kind of way, are subsidizing the homes on the bigger lots. That is sometimes hard for people to, to understand. So a couple other graphics um, that we put together. So 31-foot wide residential street, this is pretty typical. Um, sometimes they're even wider than this um, in a suburban context. 70-foot lots. Um, so on this 1,000-foot block, you've got 14 lots, right? Um, or I'm sorry, 28. You've got 14 on each side. 28 lots total. Take the cost of that street, you divide it by 28 lots, and it comes out to about 19,000 per lot to replace that street. 
Um, if we narrow that a little bit, if we just narrow that street four feet and we narrow those lots to 50s, you get 40 lots on that, that drops the cost per lot down to just under 12,000, right? So another thing, the width of street, the width of pavement, pavement costs roughly anywhere from one to $2 million per 11 foot lane mile, right? So for one, 11, one mile of an 11 foot lane, it's between one and 2 million bucks to replace. I'm gonna just do easy math. Say most, say all of your residential streets in Garland are 33 feet wide, three lanes, right? That's somewhere between three to six million dollars a mile to replace. Now add up all of the miles of residential street in Garland, right? <clears throat> and that's just the street. That's not water sewer that are done with enterprise funds. That's not drainage or parks. That's just the streets. Um, so again, some assumptions in here, but basically what this is showing, so that the top row is the, the biggest, the widest streets, the biggest lots. Um, if you had a 0.5 tax rate and 10% of your property tax went to streets, the average home value there would need to be 760,000, right? The narrow street, narrow lot, the average home value would have to be 475. That's if 10% of your property tax revenue went to streets, right? Um, so how do we how do we increase revenue, right? The, the revenue side of the equation. On the cost side, if we reduce streets, we can take as we rebuild them, we can take a big chunk out of things. But on the revenue side, a couple of things. Lot coverage is one. Basically, the more building you put on a lot, the more revenue it's going to generate, right? If you have parking lots, if you have bigger yards, um, that value per acre is going to go going to go down. The second one is height. This is easier for folks to understand. Think about a one story versus a two story house, right? The more stories you go, the more value you're going to, uh, you're going to generate. Small development. This is something that we recommend a lot, both because it closes the revenue gap for cities, but it also starts to introduce that affordability, addressing that affordability um, challenge that we have too. This is held true in every city we've ever modeled all across Texas and in other states. What you're seeing here, the, the size of the lots goes across the bottom. So the smaller lots are on the left, the biggest lots are on the right. The blue, blue, purple, blue bars, that shows the average value, the average structural value or the average home value on each of those different lot sizes. This is from Taylor, Texas, I believe, outside of Austin. Um, and then that blue line is the revenue per acre, right? And so everywhere we've ever done this, the revenue per acre will go down from the, the smallest lots have the highest revenue per acre, the largest lots have the lowest revenue per acre. So that smallest lot has the highest tax revenue per acre to the city, and it's the most affordable to build and to live in, right? This has really started to explode with COVID, right? Businesses, this also holds true for commercial, right? Think about all the, the spaces in your downtown, those, 20 foot, those 25 by 100 foot spaces, right? Those are the highest re property tax revenue per acre in the city, way more than any of the other kind of commercial that you have. They're also more affordable because they're smaller, right? <clears throat> so it's a big win-win getting more of this small development. Unfortunately, a lot of the cities that we work with, the zoning codes do not allow those smaller lots to be built. A lot of cities that pull us in are actually, the conversation is going, we want, we want to raise the minimum lot size. We want to make our lots bigger, right? And what they end up doing is, is developers get kind of squeezed into that middle one, which is an absolute money pit for cities because it has the most infrastructure, the most land usage, and the home values, um, unless they continue to go up, don't cover it. Um, so how do we translate this into the plan? Um, these are steps that we're going to work through with you all. We're doing the baseline analysis right now. That's what we're going to present um, next month. So you can show just how is the pattern, how is Garland performing right now? Um, where are the productive places? Where are the places that are struggling and why, right? Um, from there, we're going to look at projecting trends. So based on the, um, the streets that you have, based on the, um, the budget that you have based on some of the affordability trends that you have, you know, what, what happens to those deferred liabilities? What does the city need to be saving or spending for future infrastructure? Um, and then when we look at the growth management, the land use and growth management, um, what kind of infill strategies? Typically, the, the simplest thing I can say if you want to close gaps is work inside out. So you start at the core of the city and you add density, you work outward from there, anywhere that has services, that has infrastructure, if it's vacant lots, you got to get buildings on it, right? Um, 
and start to make those neighborhoods more compact and more complete and thicken them up a little bit and then you just have to know what neighborhoods are going to stay the same you know what neighborhoods are we not going to touch the residents the city everybody agrees we're going to keep these exactly the way they are you just got to know what those generate and know what they cost and and the rest of the city has to be planned um, to manage to that um, and then the, the last part is coming through once we do um, the um, the land use plan we show the kind of the future growth strategies that the communities helped inform then we'll look we'll run numbers again and say where does this put you does this close your gap does it make it bigger um, hopefully we we do our job and we get to a place that closes your gap um, or at least moves you in that in that kind of direction um, a couple of the strategies that you can expect to hear us talk about building more complete neighborhoods um, missing middle housing is a term that basically talks about everything between the big huge apartment complex and the single family lot, right? They're, they're everything from cottages to duplexes, triplexes, smallplex, um, live work units. There's a lot of different kind of housing that you'll see, especially up in the Northeast, <clears throat> that it's at different sizes, it's at different price points, and it serves multiple generations of a family so that as you go up, you know, you go and you, you get into a suburban single family home because you got three kids and you need the space. Then you want to downsize, you don't want the yard, whatever, right? Our, our cities in North Texas need to do a better job of providing some of these different kinds of housing so that as our demographics are changing, which they are, there are a lot more older folks, we have a lot more younger folks that don't want anything to do with the suburbs. They grew up in the suburbs, they never want to go back, right? <clears throat> I think I mentioned last time, my, my wife is a counselor and she talks with a lot of families and kids. And the kids growing up in the suburbs will tell you part of why they do this is because they're absolutely miserable in their neighborhood. Right? They can't go walk by and talk to Mrs. Smith you know, on, the front, on the front yard and stuff like that. They can't walk to the park because the, the mom thinks the cars drive too fast and they don't trust them to get there. It's, we have designed so many things out of our neighborhoods. Uh, our kids uh, are really suffering and I've seen it um, some with, with my own. So complete neighborhoods and building the full mix of housing is really important. Um, prioritizing infill development. This is from South Bend, Indiana. South Bend, if you've ever been there, is a pretty... Uh, tired and aging place. Um, they have a huge incremental development movement happening where all of these aging places, they've kind of loosened up their codes. They're working with local developers to come in and rebuild these places that bring in those different kind of housing um, and that build wealth for the locals. So these aren't outside developers that are doing this. This is a guy by the name of Mike Keen that's built all, every project that you see in this picture is his. Um, he was a college professor before he got into this learned how to do it, and now he's just replicating it one after another after another. <clears throat> um, retrofitting and right-sizing corridors. We have a lot of corridors in our towns that are, have way more lanes than we need. Um, you know, we need to look at repurposing those, adding bike lanes, um, looking at, you know, at better uh, public transit stops. Not every road. You're going to have plenty of roads here in Garland that have to stay, you know, moving cars. <clears throat> this is from Lower Greenville down in Dallas. It was a very ugly, tired over uh, oversized corridor, they uh, they invested in making it more of what some will say a complete street. Um, slows the cars down, has on street parking, has wider sidewalks, and then a lot of those businesses have redeveloped to kind of come out in front onto the street. Um, and oh, by the way, when they did that, the value per acre, both property and sales tax from all that adjacent development, skyrocketed. <clears throat> Maximizing infrastructure investments. Your city only has so much money to spend on infrastructure, so you don't want to just blindly go around replacing and putting back what's there. You want to think more intentionally about what kind of infrastructure would help transform this neighborhood to be more productive so that it can pay for the infrastructure long term. This is an example from Pasadena, Texas. They had this old, older neighborhood in the north or a couple of neighborhoods in the north part of town that flooded all the time. Um, some of the oldest infrastructure in the city um, also, some homes that were um, the, in neighborhoods that were in an area that they could provide different kinds of housing to start to diversify their housing types. So they got a, a federal grant for um, disaster mitigation, flood mitigation from, um, I don't remember which hurricane it was. Um, but they took that and they coordinated it with some economic development uh, incentive money and some, from some infrastructure money and intentionally started to go into this area and redesign these streets 
to address the drainage issue, number one, but also make them more walkable. Um, and then I don't have a picture of it here, but then the developer side started to come in and at the same start time started to convert some of these homes either into live work or tear down the homes and replace them with, uh, with row houses, duplexes, things like that, that benefited from a more walkable um, mobility network. Aging places and, and buildings. This in Garland is gonna take the whole spectrum from some incremental redevelopment, which is an example here. We're working with Monty Anderson down in Duncanville. Um, we actually just put our office down um, down here with, with him, but this is you know an old tired, mostly vacant strip center when he got it. Um, it happens to have a middle school just across the street from it and then a neighborhood all around it. Um, but we're incrementally putting this back together. So some of the trouble clients, um, Monty worked with code enforcement um, and got them out. He's filled up every tenant, and he's got one space left to fill. So that was the first step. Then he did some facade improvements on it. I don't know if I have another one. No, I don't. Did some facade improvements. Um, the next thing that we did is, is kind of right uh, across the top, right out in front of Wheatland Road. We're, we're ripping out about 15 to 20 feet of that parking lot there and putting in landscaping so that the street frontage uh, looks a lot better. Um, and then the last part of it is you can kind of tell from that image in the top right, but right in the middle of that parking lot, we're going in with 16 to 20 townhomes right in the middle of it. Um, there's opportunities to do this at different scales all over the place, including here in Garland. Um, that's one incremental way to get at it. There's also some of these that are good opportunities to work with a, a developer to buy up the whole thing, scrape it, and just redevelop it as more of a neighborhood mixed use center. Um, but we have to pay attention to these because if you don't, what they do is they, they plateau on the tax rolls and then they start to go down. And then they start to be a code enforcement thing and bad things happen. <laughs> um, this is another one, buildings. You can see left, right, before, after. There's a lot of buildings like this that, that are aging that we let go. There are opportunities for adaptive reuse to put some investment back into them, turn them into neighborhood centers, co-working spaces. This example, Tyler Station, this is one of the ones that we're gonna go on the tour with the council to see, but this one is a, a huge building, but it's got everything from a co-working space, a yoga studio, a brewery, um, a candle maker, a woodworker, um, and everything in between, all in one, all in one place. Um, skyrocketed on the tax rolls and has become the like neighborhood destination for everybody that lives around there either working or entertainment after hours or both um, the last thing is just doing small incremental things with your residents to to enhance public spaces just something as simple as paint um, this is from berwick louisiana we worked there a couple of years ago one of the complaints that they had was they had all of these underpasses that were just nasty right they're just gray nasty concrete everywhere they worked with a couple of local artists but we did a two-day workshop out there and basically came up with like 14 things that they could do right now with the resources they had with volunteers or city to start to make enhance enhancements in one weekend they got i think it was three it might have been four artists came out and they painted murals like this all over the city right another thing that they heard is we want pickleball courts their parks department could not afford to build pickleball courts anywhere so what did they do? They went in some of the underpasses that had shade, painted some pickleball courts. It's not the most ideal place to pay pickleball, but it's for them, it's a place. Um, little things make a, a big difference. Um, and this is right here at home. I don't know if you guys will recognize this. Anybody know where this is? It's intrinsic today, right? That picture on the left is post-tornado. It was just sitting there, right? Nothing was happening. I don't know the whole story of what happened here, but a little bit of love got put into it. Twinkly lights do amazing things. They started to rent this out for weddings, receptions, all kind of other stuff, and that's evolved now to, uh, to intrinsic uh, in the space that they have uh, next door to them. So a lot of times we, we don't realize how what a big impact some of these small investments can have in terms of the aesthetic appeal of your community, um, the culture, the, the feeling of it, the civic pride that you feel, um, and so on the implementation side of this, when we're done, um, there's going to be a lot of things that we talk about of what can the city do, but what are ways that the residents can also get involved to make your neighborhoods better. Um, so again, you know, fiscally sustainable development is the most important thing to us. We, we want to help Garland lay out a plan for a future that you can utilize growth and, and redevelopment to close your resource gaps, to close affordability gaps to build more vibrant neighborhoods that are, that are human scale for 
multiple generations and for people to be able to get around um, whatever manner they need to. Um, again, having that common language helps with that one on the right. You know, when, when you have a common language to talk about things, you can start to cultivate that, that culture of trust and collaboration and communication because everything can be tied back to why are we doing this? Why did we make the, why did we approve this? Why did we turn this down, right? Um, and then the, the, the last one there is self-sustaining local economy and workforce. There's a huge opportunity to build and grow your local economy with local entrepreneurs and small spaces that, that serve these local neighborhoods. Um, and then last but not least, the whole real purpose of a comp plan um, is to get things aligned between what's the vision of your community, what's your land use and your zoning and your infrastructure design, um, and all of those, those codes and guidelines that your planning commission and your council and your staff look at um, to make those daily uh, decisions. So uh, this is what a few folks that have been through this process with us say. Um, I hope that some of you that, that we interact with at the end of this will have th similar things to say, but you know, we've had residents say this makes so much sense. I've never thought about this before. Um, we've had a lot of residents say that second one. I had no idea we were so far behind on our infrastructure, right? Um, a council person said this process creates transparency and accountability between elected officials and their constituents and provides a way to balance demands of today and tomorrow. Um, something some of council members that I've met from older, older cities will say they wish they could go back and talk to their predecessors from like 30 or 40 or 50 years ago and ask them, you know, why did you make these decisions? Um, look what you left us with. Um, and then that last one's from the assistant city manager from Taylor that we went through this process for their comp plan. Um, and when we got to their scenarios, they basically had two scenarios to think about. They had a business as usual that was kind of growing outward where going into this, the, the council said, you know, we thought our community wanted the Costco's and the Chick-fil-A's and the suburban stuff out on the edge to help us be like another Round Rock or a Georgetown or somewhere like that. Um, but when we gave them two scenarios at the end, one was growing outward and one was what they called the, the fiscal first scenario, which had a lot of inside out. So grow, put the growth in the inside, maintain those traditional neighborhoods in the core, build more of those traditional neighborhoods. Over 80% of the people that voted on those scenarios picked the fiscal first scenario. And so that's what they ended up approving. So this is a really powerful way to think about development in a, maybe a different way instead of us just saying, hey, what do you want, what do you want Garland to be like 40 years from now, right? It's a very different question if I say, here's where Garland is, here's the liabilities that are out there, here's the kinds of housing that you have and the kind of housing you're going to need. Now what kind of growth do you want to have in the next 30, 40 years? So I think that's it. Any questions for me on this? And then Maddie's got a quick wrap up for us. Yes, ma'am. Um, <clears throat> you were at TML last week, weren't you? Yeah, okay. So Monty, who, and you were at the thing at Tyler Station. Yeah. So a couple things. The first thing that, that I've learned from Monty, who does a lot of different um, scales of, of small development, is focus on the opportunities, right? You're always going to have out-of-state owners that are sitting on their property and they don't want to do anything. And, and so look around, find the, places, find the places that do have local ownership that do want to contribute. And it's kind of like a development version of peer pressure. You just start to make that place a little bit better and a little bit better, and it's going to force their values up whether they want it or not. Um, and at some point, they will either say, you know what, we want to, we actually want to play too, um, or um, they'll end up selling. Um, sometimes if you get them at the right time and you, and you convey it in the right way, you might be able to change their mind. But Usually if we just lurk and say, Where all, where's the low-hanging fruit? Where are the easiest opportunities, the people that have smaller projects that we can do something and start there and then let the momentum build? That's what I would say on that. The second one is um, you would be surprised at the different kind of financing that's out there for small developers. 
Um, we have somewhere soon, we have a workshop. We have a couple workshops in our scope to one to just kind of explore and ask questions of what's the business and development um, environment like in Garland and then a second one to work with people who are interested in the small development model and actually get them together with Monty um, to come and do a workshop to teach that model of like here's how you do it incrementally here's how you get the financing to do it um, <clears throat> and the secret whether it's Tyler Station a Wheatland Plaza or a single building um, this is kind of Monty's secret to success you look at what that market can afford to pay, not in a per square foot, but just in a, a net amount. So people in this area could pay $500 a month to rent a commercial space or $400 a month for a residential space, whatever. And then he looks at it from the cost of the building and the pro forma and basically shrinks those spaces down to where he can get enough dollar per square foot out of it at that at that rate. So maybe it's 500 bucks a month that that person can pay, but it's a 300 square foot space or whatever he shrinks things down small enough to make the math work for him and then he does it incrementally so he gets in a little bit and then he evolves the building and, and gradually grows that value um, and every single time i hear people say nobody would want spaces that small and every single time they're leased before he even finishes construction do not underestimate the demand for smaller more affordable commercial and residential space and not just from the poor people. I'm talking from kids coming right out of college. They don't want it. They want to spend their money on other things and they, they can't find it. And you know what about young or about the young kids coming out of school? Who wants those? The employers, right? And so employers are wanting to be in places that have more of these walkable mixed use places as, as well. So if there's any if any of you all here tonight are interested in that small development model if you know other people that are entrepreneurs or might want to start and get into some of that stuff we are going to have some workshops later on to start to hear from Monty who's done some of the ones that you saw tonight and start to coach uh, that model any other questions one more um, I think one of the Yep. Because it would take business away from downtown. But with, in, in your plan, it, would that still be a, a viable use? Like I live off of 30. The thing that frustrates me is what gets built to the church right on 30. Well, how much property tax mm -hmm. are you really getting there? Yeah. So. Um, you know, there's a whole scale of development strategies here. You guys have some key sites. 635 is one, 30 is one, Harbor Point is a huge site that's an opportunity. So there's, there's opportunity in Garland for all kinds of infill and redevelopment and new development at every scale. Um, I think, you know, what this process is ultimately about is, is educating and engaging the community to help you understand the fiscal impacts of different development and how it needs to fit together um, so that your staff can start to put zoning and other things in place to get more of the kind of things that you want in the places that you want them, um, and also make it harder to build some of the things that you that you don't want. But still, as a property right state, if it's if it's zoned something right now, they have the ability to build that by right. That's that's that comes after the comp plan to look at zoning. Um, but you guys have you you have the whole, Garland is so big. You have you have the whole spectrum of you've got highway frontage in multiple contexts. You know, you've got an awesome downtown that, that is really starting to, to go. You've got older neighborhoods that have narrower streets and grid that are kind of the, the bones for the kind of walkable mixed use places that young and old want to be to. And you have some of the more of the single family, larger lot stuff that is still, you know, people want as well. And they would love to have it closer to downtown and closer to a train station that they could get into downtown Dallas. So you have a lot of things going for you. Um, but. I mean, hopefully tonight we're just setting that foundation for how we're going to frame these conversations of what do you do with the land and the property and the buildings and the infrastructure that you have? What stays the same? What needs to be, re, you know, tweaked a little bit? What needs to be blown up and, and completely redone? Awesome. I'll stick around and answer more questions after this, but I want to make sure we let Maddie do her closing and, and let you all that want to go home and go to bed <laughs> like me. <laughs> Thank you.
All right, so I just want to touch on some of the next kind of engagement opportunities that we have coming up. Uh, so this month we are going to have our second survey. Um, we did get a question about the results for the first survey, so we'll be pushing out some updates to uh, the project website. We'll make sure that the city gets uh, some awesome uh, infographics and things to help them promote those results as well. Uh, but that second survey is going to be coming out this month. We'll have some more updates um, regarding that on the project website. Um, our third survey is going to take place in November, and that's getting into what Kevin was talking about, sort of the local business environment. Um, and then our neighborhood assessments, which are going to look at Garland on a more uh, kind of granular scale, like more in-depth into the neighborhood specifically, will be taking place through um, December of this year through March of next year. Um, and then we do have, as Kevin mentioned, the land use fiscal analysis, the LUFA results presentation um, that is set to take place on December 11th. Uh, that is going to be a really helpful one that is going to be covering a lot of this information that we went over tonight, but Garland specifically. Um, if you could make it to one thing coming up, I would highly suggest uh, looking into that and being there because it is, it's very important. It is the basis of what the work that we're going to be doing and things like that. Um, and it's going to be forming, helping us form a lot of these recommendations and actions that will be in the implementation chapter of the plan. Um, our next trip won't be until March. Uh, we'll have dates finalized for that pretty soon. And we'll get that updated on the website. And then, uh, we do have, uh, two more trips after that. So the next one will be in June of 2025. And then the last one will be in August of 2025 before adoption. Um, but yeah, we'll be hanging around for a little bit. So if y'all have any questions, uh, please let me know. But um, as always, we do have the project website. If you would like to get in contact with us, we do have an option for you to uh, send in like a comment or uh, send an email directly also. Um, so please reach out, give us your ideas, come talk to us. So that should be it for tonight, but I really want to thank everybody who was able to make it tonight, and we do really appreciate your participation and um, look forward to hearing everybody's ideas. So. Yeah.